Thank you, Sherry. So, you've seen one. I want to hold this up and show it to you. This is the uh, 21 Dangerous Prayers, 21 Day Transformational Prayer Guide. And uh, I have been reading through this off and on and, and looking through this. And uh, Gary Rohrmeyer is the guy who designed this. Gary is a, um, I can't really quite call Gary quite a friend. That might be over exaggerating. But Gary's a guy I know. Uh, Gary leads um, uh, Converge, is it Mid America? Uh, Converge Mid America. So if you've met Dan Carlson for Converge North Central, he's Dan's counterpart for that conference, uh, kind of next door, encompasses. Wisconsin and Illinois and a bunch of other states. And uh, Gary's a really neat guy and, and really has a passion for prayer. And as you read through this, I think you will see that in his heart. It's really a, a fabulous resource that he's put together that I think if you grab one of these and you do this over the next 21 days, you will be pushed and challenged to grow and uh, to, to examine your own prayer life and your relationship and walk with God. And, 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 and I do think it's a really, really wonderful tool. And so we've ordered 50 of these. I've got the 51st. Um, so there's 50 of these that we can give away today. If you would like one of these, take it home with you and use it. If you're going to take it, please do use it, because we do have a limited number of the print copies. Uh, I put on Facebook, um, you'll be able to see that if you go home, a link to a couple of different versions of it online, electronic versions. Ruth has got it on the screen here where you can also find it. Um, but the one to get, so there's two of them. There's a 21 days of prayer, which we did last year. We're doing dangerous prayers this year. So we're kind of, you know, going to that next level, right? Uh, Taking it to the dangerous level. So grab the dangerous prayer one so that you'll be on pace with us. And so, as I said, get a copy of that. Work your way through that and uh, be blessed by it. Because I know God uh, really can can work in and through that. Um, There are quite a number of other churches doing this. This is something that we do in conjunction with Converge. And so we have churches be it in Florida or Massachusetts or California or Washington State, all across the country, who simultaneously are doing this with us. Now, some of them are doing it at the exact same time. Some of them will be doing it maybe next month or, or whatever. But it's a great chance for us as churches to kind of have some, some unity and bonding together along with that. And so I uh, would challenge you, get a copy, be part of it, see what God does. I'm looking forward to how this will kick us off for this year. Uh, and as we work through those prayer journals, as I said, we're going to be focusing in on, we're going to be honing our prayer lives, and, and we'll have a corresponding sermon series to go along with that. And so today, just to kick it off, I'm going to talk about, well, what, what is dangerous prayer, right? You know, I mentioned dangerous prayer, but what exactly is dangerous prayer? And if you'd like to follow along, I'm going to be uh, pretty much exclusively in Genesis. Um, starting off with Genesis 32, I'm going to read you a big chunk of Genesis 32, Uh, 22 through 32. If you don't know where Genesis is, very first book of the Bible, uh, the word Genesis simply means beginnings. It's first. It's the first place in your Bible. So if you open up your Bibles, there are some in the chairs. Uh, You feel free to use an electronic device. If you've got it on a phone or a tablet or something that you brought with you, you can look it up. But it'll be Genesis 32. 32 is the big number, and then 22 is the small number. Genesis 32, 22 through 32. And I will read that, and we will throw it on the screen here for you to to follow along as well. And so let me, let me, oops, what's that? Oh, yes, yes. Uh, are we doing children's church today? I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. That's a good question. Thank you. A valid, valid question. Why don't we send the kids out as they're excited or ready to go? They're like, man, I don't want to be here for dangerous prayer. Especially Jojo. He was shot out of a cannon this morning. Sorry, kids. We do have Children's Church, if you're not familiar with it. It's an age-appropriate lesson for our students, and the Lanes and the Swansons uh, guide our children through that and do a wonderful job and are a blessing to, to have doing that. And so we're thankful. And I guess Jackie's a Johnson, but technically related to the Lanes. So we'll include the Johnsons, too. But uh, So back to what I was saying. We're going to be in Genesis 32, and you're welcome to use an electronic device. I'm going to read it. You'll see it on the screen as well. Uh, starting in 22 in Genesis 32, it says, uh, that same night, Jacob, is who we're talking about here, that same night, he arose and took his two wives and his two female servants and his 11 children, and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and he sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. 
Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, You shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him, and he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Jacob. Many of you know him, but uh, let me give you some background on him anyhow. Uh, Humanly speaking, few of us would have chosen Jacob for some sort of great honor. Because, you see, Jacob had spent a great deal of his life deceiving others, cheating others to get his way. Jacob had prayed on his brother Esau. They were twins. He had prayed on his brother Esau, uh, prayed on his weakness to steal his brother's birthright. We saw that in chapter 25. He also conspired with his mother to deceive his father along the way in chapter 27. And then on top of that, he didn't turn the other cheek when kind of a, a little play happened on him when his good old uncle Laban had cheated him. And that was back in chapter 30. Throughout his life, Jacob displays a a disturbing tendency to rely upon himself himself instead of upon the Lord's presence and power. In fact, his very name, the, the name of Jacob, means deceiver. Right? Yeah, Dad, thanks for that. If you've named your kid Jacob, I apologize. It means deceiver, right? It's okay. You can name your kid Jacob. Jacob's a, a good name and um, historically is, is a great name. But, but Jacob himself out of the Bible was, was a mess, right? He had a really screwy, messed up life. But God used him anyhow, if you know his story. And if God could use a jacked up, messed up guy like Jacob, deceiver, liar, cheater, swindler, Well, then maybe there's a little hope for you and me too, right? Now, this part of the story, this is a pivotal moment in Jacob's life as he returns back home to the promised land. He'd been away for 20-some years, and along the way, he's picked up a couple of wives and a whole bunch of livestock and and a couple of handfuls and some toes worth of kids. This conniving man who tricked his father, who stole his brother's birthright, is now preparing to go back to the promised land. But the problem in that is, his brother Esau still lives there. Now Jacob is a whole lot wealthier now than he was when he left. And we can only hope he's also a little bit more mature this go around, right? If you know Jacob's story, his first life-changing event comes in a dream. But this second life-changing event came on a night in which he got no sleep at all. Jacob was literally up all night long. He's, he's wrestling with an angel of God, whom he comes to understand that is actually God himself. Have you ever spent a night, uh, maybe a long, sleepless night, wrestling with God yourself? I have. I've certainly. And I think that this wrestling with God is part of what prayer is actually for. Now, while you and I might not get to actually physically wrestle with God, we certainly can and should do so in prayer. And as we do this, as we we wrestle with God in prayer, we will find that that in response to this wrestling with God, God will mark our lives. Just as he did Jacob's. We see in the story, Jacob was humbled physically. But but he was also reminded that, that he was changed spiritually by God in this process. Now, 
in my experience, I think a lot of times people are, are a little uncomfortable, frankly, to bring their real feelings to God. They're, they're afraid to be honest and transparent with God. It, it is okay to pray for things that you want. It, it, it's okay to pray that God would bless you. That's a good thing. It's even okay to, to ask God to forgive you and to, to heal you and to protect you and to and pray to God to provide for you. But can you really pray to God and tell Him that you're angry at Him? That you're dissatisfied? That you're disappointed? That sounds dangerous, Pastor. I can't, I can't pray like that, can I? Yes. Yes, you can. And you should, in fact. Jacob was desperate for God. His scheming 20 years earlier had left his brother in a murderous mood. And he had 20 years to think about this. So you can imagine uh, something festering for 20 years between brothers can, can get ugly pretty fast, right? And now Jacob is returning back to the homeland to find who knows what. But he, he hears word. You see, he had some scouts. He sent some scouts ahead. Jacob wasn't a fool. Had some scouts go out ahead. And one of them comes back and says, uh, Jacob, you might want to just know that Esau is coming and he's bringing 400 men. Remember how many people he, Jacob had with him? Two wives, a couple handfuls, and some toes worth of kids, right? Your brother's coming with 400 dudes. I can do math that's not in his favor. If you go back a little bit further in the story in verse 7, it says that Jacob had great fear and distress. Appropriate response, probably. So in typical Jacob cunning, he divides his camp into two different groups, thinking that, well, if, if I split my wives and I send half this way and I send half this way, and my brother comes, maybe half can survive? Right? He's hedging his bets. If my brother comes and he attacks us, if I split my family, maybe he won't wipe us out entirely. Not only does he do that, 